call our uh, House Education Policy Committee meeting to order today. There is a quorum present, and we will proceed. Uh, as far as we get into the uh, minutes here, uh, Representative Frazier, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes? And if so, would you like to motion to approve it? I have. So move, Madam. I mean, so move, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Wonderful. Representative Frazier moves to approve the minutes from Wednesday, the 21st of February. Is there any discussion? And seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Very good. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Today we are going to start with uh, representatives, excuse me, Chair Pryor is going to start us off with House File 3872. It's provisions related to pre-kindergarten through 12th uh, grade education including general education, education excellence, teacher literacy, charter schools, nutrition, health, safety, early learning, and education partnerships and compacts modified, and the reports required. Tam uh, the time allocated here, we have about 75 minutes uh, to move through this bill. And uh, I want to start by reminding folks that we will be considering House File 3782 here. And it's our intention to hear this bill and lay it over for further consideration. Rep. Pryor, would you like to motion House File 3782 before the committee to lay the bill over for that further consideration? So moved. Wonderful. And before uh, you or our Department of Education uh, friends introduce the bill, I understand there's an amendment that you'd like to uh, get the bill in the shape that you'd prefer. Can you please motion the A3 amendment before us? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Now that the A3 amendment is before us, can somebody from MDE briefly describe the amendment, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Chair Pryor. My name is Megan Ariola. I'm the Legislative Coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, the A3 amendment is uh, reflecting on some feedback we received after our hearing of this bill in the Senate, as well as some uh, technical adjustments to make sure that our bill aligns with the bill from Pelsby uh, with our shared provisions, as well as we received some feedback on um, our language around uh, libraries and book banning prohibitions as well as some uh, technical changes to align our early learning article with relevant other language and updating that. So it's very technical, Bill, reflects feedback we've gotten. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Ariola. We'll now move to adopt the A3 amendment so that you can present the bill in the way it's intended. All those in favor of adopting the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Very good. The A3 amendment is adopted. Now, before we begin the bill presentation uh, and the walkthrough, members, I want to quickly remind you, uh, please take notes. Please hold your questions to the end. And with that said, I want to welcome the Commissioner of MDE, uh, Willie Jett, uh, to the Education Policy Committee. And whenever you're ready, Chair Pryor, if you want to begin, um, we'll start with you and you can introduce the bill. I think that was bill. an excellent introduction. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Representative Lori Pryor, um, House District 49A. Um, and I, um, it's my honor to present um, what is known as the Governor's Policy Bill. And we have um, with us, as you, as you noted, uh, Commissioner Jett to begin the presentation of the bill. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Willie Jett, and I serve as the Commissioner of Education. I appreciate the opportunity to share are my thoughts today regarding the Governor's Education Policy Bill. First and foremost, I want to express gratitude to Madam Chair for her authorship of the bill and for convening this hearing to discuss our proposal. Next slide. Last year marked a significant period during which the legislature enacted numerous beneficial policies aimed at fostering a safe, healthy, and supportive educational environment for both students and educators. Many of these initiatives align with our 10 commitments to equity. As a department, we are continuing to develop proposals that address technical matters, provide clarification in statutory language, and facilitate smoother operations. Specifically, we have recommendations concerning assessments, online instruction, and the READ Act, among others. We firmly believe there is still room for improvements in enhancing the educational experience 
for students and for families. This includes endeavors to enhance language accessibility for English learners and their parents. Additionally, the administration is eager to engage in discussions regarding the recognition of invaluable contributions made by our professional librarians and the preservation of Minnesota's public libraries as vital sources of information, freely accessible to all. Our team will also present proposals aimed at refining licensure statutes to ensure that students receiving special education services continue to benefit from expertise of high caliber educators. In building upon the progress made last year concerning charter schools, we are committed to enhancing accountability, providing stability for students and families within the charter school system, and ensuring responsible management of public funds. And again, I want to extend my appreciation to Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to present our policy bill today. And with that said, I will now yield the floor to Shana Morris and Megan Ariola from the Government Relations Team who will provide a detailed overview of the policy bill. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And welcome back, Ms. Ariola. If you would start by reintroducing yourself for the record. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Megan Ariola. I'm the legislative coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, I will go ahead and kick us off reminding the group that uh, Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Education centers all of our actions and, response and responsibilities around our commitments to our 10 Minnesota commitments to equity. Starting off in Article 1, Section 1, this uh, proposal authorizes school districts and charter schools to release specific student data to the Department of Employment and Economic Development for purposes of coordinating special education services under uh, the pre-employment transition services for students with disabilities. I did just want to note that this bill is also being heard in the Judiciary Committee tomorrow since it does touch on Section 16, <clears throat> excuse me, since it does touch on Section 13, excuse me, uh, around student data. This is as a result of the classification of student directory information as private data in last year's bill. Section 2 deletes the Shape America standards and sample assessments requirement for MDE. Uh, last year, uh, we removed the requirement for MDE to utilize Shape standards as the state physical ed standards. There was some language that was left behind referencing Shape that is no longer required, and so we just need to clean up statute to remove that paragraph to keep things in alignment. Um, MDE already uses the Shape national standards during our academic revision process. And the last sentence of this paragraph is that is being stricken states a requirement for MDE to develop sample assessments. We have those. We've been using them for about six years. So we can go ahead and remove that. Section 3 delays the requirements around government and citizenship to begin in the 25-26 school year to allow some administrative relief for our, uh, for our school districts as they implement the new social study standards next year. It also replaces a reference to credits with a reference to credit for the purpose of physical education credits for graduation, students only need one. Section four shifts reporting dates regarding the rigorous course taking report from reporting in February to shifting that to by July 1st, 2025 and each subsequent year by July 1st. The current deadline of February 1st requires MDE to take data from half of a school year. If we shift this to July, Instead of the report, the report reflecting the past 18 months, so the past full school year, as well as the past six months of the first part of the school year, with a July 1st deadline, this will allow for the data to reflect the full prior school year instead of 18 months. Section 5 through 10 do a number of areas of cleanup to the statewide testing statute, 120B.30. Anybody who has ever dove into 120B.30 knows it's had a lot of changes in the past few years and needs some statutory cleanup. So as uh, stewards of the education statutes, we view it as our responsibility to make that clear. So Section 5 shifts Minnesota Statute 120B.3, subdivisions 1 through 6. Those were renumbered during the 2023 bill. So the stricken subdivision 1A that you see there is being replaced by its current location in law. Section 6, the stricken paragraph A in Section 6 of Subdivision 12 of 120B.3 talks about making accommodations for assessments. The rest of the subdivision that this statement is in refers to disclosures and test monitoring. 
So we are looking to shift these rights to the more appropriate section, 120B.305, which also deals with accommodations and assessments. Section 7 adds a paragraph as what looks like a new subdivision, but this language currently appears in 120B.31, subdivision 6. And in addition to this language not being new, just being new in a different place in statute, these rights are already afforded to our school employees. Section 8, the language stricken in this section was relocated to another part of 120B as part of the 2023 legislation. The new language on page 8, I believe, contains much of the stricken language and just relocated again to a more appropriate subdivision in statute and reworded for ease of readability. Section 9, this section also contains language that was relocated from Section 8. It also removes some unnecessary duplicative language that appear in improper locations. Finally, Section 10, um, this language stricken is already being reported in a number of other reports that MDE puts out. Removing this section just eliminates some administrative duplicative work. Section 11 changes the uh, assessment reporting dates that MDE has to follow from the current language, which reads that we have to post these assessment reports by September 1st or October 1st, depending on if that year is uh, required to be implementing new academic standards. We are suggesting to shift this MDE reporting requirement to December 1st because this aligns with other states' national practice. Most other states post this data on December 1st. By pushing this out for MDE's requirements to report by December 1st, it just gives us a little bit of time to work with administrators depending on their workload, get the data out that meets a national timeline, and MDE staff are confident that given our ability to publish well before December 1st in the past, we will continue to well beat that deadline. Section 12 clarifies new language um, regarding post-secondary enrollment options from last year. <laughs> There was language added uh, regarding students um, withdrawing from or otherwise not completing programs and the requirements to notify a school district or the post-secondary institution. When we were reading the language this year and working on how to implement that, we received calls with just some lack of clarity as to who had to report what to whom and when. So the language being inserted here makes it clear that once the student is no longer attending a PSEO course, the responsibility for reporting and communication of administrative stuff should lie with the adults in the situation, so the post-secondary institution and the school district that the child attends. Section 13 is a correction to the Online Instruction Act from last year. Um, this is a citation to certain areas of federal law. This was included in, the affirm in what used to be known as the Online Learning Act, which we repealed and replaced last year with the Online Instruction Act. So this inserts section 504 and 508 to be cited back to in the Online Instruction Act. Section 508 of the federal law being cited there focuses on accessibility in digital learning spaces, whereas 504 is accessibility in brick and mortar school settings. Another amendment to the Online Instruction Act just includes um, allowing districts to continue to be able to collect supplemental course fees for students not taking full-time online instruction from that district. Section 15 is an update in language to the Achievement and Integration Statutes. These used to be known as what, uh, desegregation districts. However, a number of years ago, the funding stream of Achievement and Integration and the plans for those districts was changed to read as Achievement and Integration. So we're just removing, removing language that we no longer use at the department. Section 16 is a technical change to the care and treatment online option statutory text reconciliation. This again is as a result of the repeal and replace of the Online Learning Act last year to what is now known as the Online Instruction Act. Section 17 contains a repealer as part of those earlier uh, sections regarding 120B.30, so that assessment statute. Article 2, Education Excellence, Sections 1 and 2 uh, re are regarding religious in instruction exemptions being extended to our tribal students. So Section 1 modifies the compulsory attendance statute that deals with excused absences to provide approved absence, excused absences from school can be for instruction in a spiritual or cultural 
ceremony or significance provided by tribal, spiritual, or cultural advisors. Line 17.28 in section one states in which the child resides. We are striking this because even though this isn't um, directly related to the tribal students, the requirement is that the principal or the superintendent of the district in which the child resides approves the excused absence. We don't, we know that there are students that don't necessarily go to the district where they are geographically located. So removing this just makes it clear that students in open enrollment should get excused absences from the district they attend. Um, lines 18.12 and 18.21 of section one remove references to religious schools and churches in only so far as it makes the sentence make better grammatical sense. Um, this is not removing the right of children seeking to have excused absences for religious instruction. We're just making the statute clear so that you don't have to be receiving this instruction in a church or a religious building. Section two provides the same kind of protection. It just amends a different statute. So this provides for excused absences from class or other activities. So this would be if the child had to attend um, a fire drill or an assembly or some other compulsory reason during the day that they could have an excused absence for a uh, situation that they would like to seek instruction from a sp tribal spiritual or cultural advisor. We also amend the, headline, the title of the statute to reflect these changes so it's not simply on the basis of religion. Sections three and four clarify the required levels of language proficiency for Minnesota bilingual seals. So this, um, this section contains some of the language from the amendment, just making that a little more consistent with our capitalization and grammar. Um, MDE has received some inquiries from families that the standards for reading, writing, and speaking to demonstrate proficiency were just a little inconsistent with the skills that students were bringing to a class. We know that learning looks different for everybody and people's skills show up in different ways. So these changes should allow for our K-12 students who may already have a significant mastery of another language besides English to receive credit, to receive a bilingual seal, to get the, um, appreciate, to get the recognition in their education of their ability to speak a language other than English. And so this modifies the assessment, uh, excuse me, not the assessment, this modifies the language skill criteria set in statute to also be more, better aligned with what we actually use to assess language assessments. Section five is a proposal to require our districts to develop a board approved language access policy plan. This, um, we currently have this section being part of a discussion on world's best workforce plans and this would just have to go into place for world's best workforce plans being amended in the year 25, 26 and on. Um, right now, districts, there's just inconsistency with families being able to understand from the get-go publicly facing what their rights are if they do not speak English as a first language when it comes to communicating with their district. So by having a district have the conversation on the record on a public facing document would make it clear for families across the state that if they move between districts, they should be able to find their same rights and the same, um, the same plan information available for how they will be able to communicate with the school district if they don't speak English. Section six clarifies that the prohibition on withholding grades or diploma for non-payment of student debt fees uh, is also applies to districts, charters, and tribal contract schools in Minnesota. Section seven regards the uh, parental notification for English learner, for parents of students in English learner programs. Um, currently the language has read a little, on, a little ambiguous over the years, 10 days, when there's a number of different kind of triggers for when a student enters a program, when these, when, these assess, when these screeners for English learner programs happen, that sort of thing. So by adopting the language in the bill, this allows for students who have been placed in an English learner program at the beginning of the school year, allows for our administrators to have a little bit of breathing room within those first 30 calendar days of a school year, which I'm sure everyone can understand involves a lot of paperwork, a lot of notifications. So any sort of breathing room we can give there is the reason behind that and the two week notice after the thir first 30 days of a calendar, of the first 30 calendar days of the school year uh, is a standard notification timeline. Section eight includes English language development standards in our EL general requirements for programs. This simply provides a citation back to Minnesota rule around what these language, English language development standards have to be. So districts receiving 
EL, <laughs> districts with EL programs are already following this. This is just codifying rule into law. Section three has to do with teachers. Section one clarifies, or article three has to do with teachers, excuse me. Section one clarifies the reporting years for the educator workforce initiatives. As we all know, this was a new report required as of last year. However, the language that passed mentions both even-numbered and odd-numbered years for reporting and would require the pro our reports to begin, I think, this month when we haven't had a chance to have these programs fully run their course yet, so we would be reporting nothing. By pushing this data out, um, by pushing this reporting timeline out, uh, as of November 3rd, we should have information ready to be able to put together a full report. So removing, so having this change for these first few years, this first kind of adjustment period, just allows us to stay in compliance with the law. Sections two through seven contain our language that we put into our uh, corrective action plan memo that we filed with the Federal Department of Education regarding tier one and tier two special education license requirements. Section two provides for the new requirements and limits around tier one special education applicants. These sections were also amended as part of the amendment as well, just to align our language with that which um, appears in Pelsby's bill. So in this first section two, there's a, there is a section that has been added in the amendment that reads the application meets all requirements set forth in subdivision one and then we go into the other requirements set forth here. So continued professional development, participation in a teacher mentoring program. There's a limit of three years for a period in which a tier one license holder can teach special education, and this was kind of the heart of the OSEP corrective action plan memo. And then finally demonstrates progress toward, license, toward professional licensure. And that professional licensure term is defined in Minnesota rule, so it does have meaning that folks can use to assess progress. Section three, insert citations back to those requirements that we just laid out in section two for tier one license holders. Section four does the same for the tier one license statute. Section five provides the requirements for our tier two special education license holders and applicants. So these contain now four of the five requirements provided in section two for our tier one applicants. This contains the same language added in the amendment that the application meets all requirements set forth in subdivision one. This also states that tier two teachers have to have continued professional development as well, also participate in a teacher mentoring program and demonstrate pr progress towards professional licensure. Section six and seven provide the same uh, citations back to the requirements set forth in section five of this article. And that is the rest of section or article three, moving on to article four, the READ Act. Section one um, corrects a citation in the READ Act title to just refer back to 120B.118, which is kind of the main READ Act statute that contains the definitions. Section two provides for what is known as a word study to be a factor in considering whether, uh, in establishing whether instruction is evidence-based or not. And if you look at section four, we do provide a definition of word study as well in there. Section three strikes from the definition of literacy specialist requirements for both the state literacy specialists at MDE and regional literacy specialists or directors. The um, old language read that these specialists did not have to complete their training before August 30 of 2025. This was meant to provide a little bit of um, a little bit of breathing room for us to be able to hire this liter state literacy specialist. However, she, she's on board, ready to go, ready to take this training. Um, so we don't see any reason for her to have to delay her training until August 30th of 2025. And of course, we don't want to cause any confusion for any future state literacy specialist hiring candidates in the future. As I said, section four provides for the definition of word study. Section five amends a section of the READ Act regarding uh, literacy goals. So there's a number of places in both statute in the READ Act and MDE guidance where the standard of reading proficiency for our students is established as grade level proficiency. And that citation of grade level was just missing from this sentence. So in order to make sure that we are using consistent language throughout statute, putting in grade level proficiency there is required. Um, the changes beginning on line 30.25 were a direct response to some inquiries that we received from the field. Um, 
there was some question about the language that was in the READ Act last year about whether teachers are subject to those training requirement deadlines of July 1st, 2027, and who that means. The old language read all other teachers, and we just got feedback that that was proving to be a little too vague or confusing, so this section just refines who these teachers are further, and this is consistent with the guidance that we've been communicating to the field. Section six updates the requirements around screening for literacy identification. So the current law requires these literacy screenings to take place twice a year. However, if you have, have been into a classroom t teaching literacy lately, screening is kind of a constant process for teachers now. They are always looking at how their students are, how their work is reflecting their reading ability, their grade level proficiency. So by establishing these three screening checkpoints, it does align with our goals in the READ Act to just increase how often we're checking in with those kids on this. And it also just aligns with the best practice that our teachers are already using. Section seven makes a corresponding alignment about that mid-year check-in on screening as well. Section eight specifies that staff development courses also have to be in structured literacy because if we're, we want them to be teaching structured literacy, it makes sense that the training should be in structured literacy. Section nine also refers back to that uh, expectation of screening to happen three times a year or that beginning of the year, mid-year, end of year basis. Section 10, the new language inserted here on line 34.12 makes it clear that there are certain assessments for which this progress monitoring they're expected to use. Section 11 uh, governs how MDE must partner with CARI to support the READ Act implementation. Replacing on line 34.20, the or with an and just aligns with the rubric requirements for approved criteria. <coughs> Section 12 uh, corrects a citation back to 120B.118, which is the definitions read act statute. Section 13 does the same to correct that citation back. However, we are also striking language on 36.30, uh, which, uh, which is not a ne necessary requirement for our other read act statutes. And so we don't want the um, folks subject to this statute, which would be people participating in our Minnesota Reading Corps program, to be held to different standards than everybody else. Section 14 allows for uh, training for our teachers to take place outside of contract hours, and it also allows districts to use funds for out of contract time training hours. Finally, Section 15 is a reviser instruction to replace any outstanding references to 120B.1117 and 120B.1118 with 120B.118 and 120B.119. And with that thrilling conclusion, I turn it over to Shana. Welcome, Assistant Director Morse. If you would uh, just identify yourself before we begin. Thank you. Mr. Chair, member Shana Morris, Assistant Director of Government Relations at the Department of Education. And I am here to cover uh, the remaining articles, articles five through nine. So starting with article uh, five on charters, the first section uh, more clearly differenti differentiates the charter management organization or CMO from an education management organization. Those definitions were passed uh, last year and um, the changes that we're proposing to make this year are to align those with how the feds look at the difference between the two entities and really simply put it's just uh, nonprofit or for-profit nothing actually changes on the ground and it's not intended to impact uh, what's currently happening uh, section two is a technical change to strike the word policy from the world's best workforce wor reference the world's best workforce requires a plan not a policy that's already named so thus the word policy is not uh, required Section three is a technical change to replace the word authorizer with organization and statutes related to the authorizer application process. After an organization is approved, they would be an authorizer, but prior to that, the more appropriate word is organization. Section four removes statement of assurances from new charter school applications in an effort to reduce redundancies. These assurances are already required in the contract between a charter and an authorizer as part of the uh, affidavit process. Section five eliminates another redundant requirement related to the affidavit process by which an authorizer states its intention uh, to charter. So how an authorizer intends to oversee a school 
and comply with a contract is already part of the authorizer's approved application under section 124E, subdivision 3, paragraph A. This section uh, 5 also clarifies that the grade and number of primary enrollment sites in an approved affidavit may only be modified in the supplemental affidavit process uh, defined in statute. Section 6 clarifies terminology used during the supplemental affidavit process to be consistent with what is communicated today. The words uh, on the page look like a lot of changes, um, but it is, it is just kind of a drafting, that's how it looks drafting wise. Um, it is not intended to change what's happening on the ground. Section 7 clarifies that a licensed teacher position required to be on the board of directors must be a teacher of record as defined in rule, which would preclude a short term substitute teacher from filling the role that's required on the board. Uh, that statute only places a minimum, so a, a short-term substitute teacher could still uh, sit on the board of directors, but it wouldn't be able to fill that sort of minimum role. Um, this section also seeks to strengthen the conflict of interest provision specifically by adding contractors to the list of individuals that may not serve on a charter board of directors and requiring disclosure if an individual uh, serves on more than one charter board. It doesn't prohibit it, it just requires disclosure. Section 8 uh, requires... Um, uh, charter board meeting minutes to be published within 30 days following their approval of a regularly scheduled meeting or, their, or a regularly scheduled meeting. Currently, the law only has a timeline in it for how long they must be published, but doesn't set a, any parameters for when they must be published. Districts already have a requirement around this. Anything beyond uh, the 365 days required in law would be subject to the, the school's retention and, and record policy. Section 9, again, seeks to strengthen the conflict of interest provisions by adding a number of individuals that must be disclosed related to contracts, leases, and purchases from them. Section 10 clarifies that only charter schools that are operational or enrolling students may change authorizers. So in other words, the uh, authorizer that approved a charter school application must be the, the one that makes the ready-to-open determination. Section 11 um, seeks to make some changes related to uh, uh, teachers. So generally speaking, teachers are employees of a school and there might be times when contracting is necessary for a specialization, uh, whether that's for like a special education service that might be low incidence or um, a specialized class like maybe Mandarin or something like that. But overall, uh, the teacher should be, the day-to-day -day instruction should be under the oversight of the board of directors. And so this section makes it clear that the responsibility to provide necessary teachers cannot be handed over in, in its entirety to uh, one of those CMO or EMOs. Section 12 removes a number of cross-references related to property and financial management uh, and inserts them into the next section, section 13. But before you see that reinserted language, you'll also see here that um, this section uh, 13 requires a procurement policy to be adopted by a charter school and sets thresholds for doing that. That is section 5, or article 5, pardon Article 6, related to nutrition and libraries, the first section here just replaces the term sponsor with the nonprofit multi-site sponsoring organization. This is intended to relate to the Child and Adult Care Food Program, or CACFP, and uh, simply put, it's a technical change to avoid confusion. Sponsor is a term that's often used with schools and how they operate nutrition programs where they can be both a sponsor and a site. The same is not true for child care. That's a federal regulation where there is... Um, a requirement that there's a, a different organization overseeing or sponsoring, essentially. Uh, and then section two of article six prohibits the governing body of a public library from banning, removing, or restricting access to an otherwise age-appropriate book based upon its content or other subjective objections. It also seeks to uplift uh, and protect the qualified individuals responsible for making collections decisions in a library. And it makes it clear that it is not infringed upon the parental right to request a curricular curricular alternative or other content uh, for that parent's child. Moving on to Article 7, Student Health and Safety. Section 1 modifies a requirement for a health services specialist, what we know at MDE, as a licensed school nurse <coughs> position. This position was passed last year, and the department has hired the position and um, uh, now up and running, but did have some challenges in the hiring process in terms of getting a wide uh, qualification qualified pool of candidates, and so this proposal here is seeking to remove the requirement for a graduate degree, which we feel is a barrier uh, to getting that wider pool, and then also striking the requirement to have supervising and budgeting experience, both of which are not duties of the actual role. Sections 2 and 3 make it clear that the Pupil Fair Dismissal Act applies to charter schools and tribal contract schools, 
and that sections that fall outside of that related to discipline policy and removal, removal from class apply to charter schools too. This is intended to codify current understanding and practice and not result in an actual change. Uh, and then section four aligns the statutory language uh, related to jurisdictional issues of 18 through 21 year old students in the student maltreatment process to align with the special education laws that provide services, that require services to be provided to age 22 or through age 21. Article eight is the early learning article. Also worth noting that this is uh, this article in and of itself is contained in House File 4176 and being heard tomorrow in the Children and Families Committee, which has, I believe, jurisdiction over uh, these items. Sections one and two here separate the definition of pre-kindergarten from kindergarten to ensure consistent understanding and application of those terms, really just uh, helping people to find it in statute and, and uplifting pre-kindergarten as a separate and, and uh, own definition, but the words are verbatim the same. Section three makes programmatic changes to merge the voluntary pre-kindergarten program and the school readiness plus uh, statutes beginning in school year 25-26. This is to create a single program and set of requirements to make clear the submission of uh, assessment data is, is to be submitted to MDE and then also streamlining the, streamlining the application process uh, for districts. And again, that's effective for the 25-26 school year, so a one year delay. Sections four and five here clarify that early learning scholarship eligibility can be based upon the parent or guardian status or the child status as it relates to categorical eligibility of being in uh, need of child protective services or foster care, having a priority status related to participating in substance use or a mental health treatment program. And situation that this might cover is where there's a child who is in foster care uh, but has a child that is not in foster care and that uh, the child um, who would be under uh, five years old, um, the, the position here would be that it should, that individual should be covered or, or qualified for a scholarship prioritized. Uh, and then section five also expands scholarships to uh, children who have an IEP or an IFSP. Section six updates age related uh, words in the definition of a developmental delay for early childhood special education services just to be consistent and also changes some outdated terminology uh, related to uh, developmental delays. Section seven adds a more specific reference to in Minnesota rule to where part C eligibility lives for early childhood special education services. Nothing is changing there. Section eight clarifies the federal position that alternative instruction before uh, special education assessment, sometimes known as a pre-referral intervention, only applies to children in uh, kindergarten and up and not early childhood special education. Section nine uh, is a reviser instruction, and then section 10 repeals that school readiness plus law. And our final article here, uh, section of article nine, section one and two, creates a standalone council for the military interstate children's compact uh, under uh, 127A.85 article eight. Currently the duties of that state council reside with the P20 council who has other duties and work. So this is a proposal to create a separate standalone committee to do that work and then section three extends the rights and benefits of that compact to the children of the Minnesota National Guard and Reserve uh, members. That concludes uh, the walk through the bill. Wonderful, and at this point, we'll now take public testimony from our folks who signed up following our protocols. From my list, our first testifier is Matt Schaefer, Policy Director for Red Allies. Please make your way to the testifier's table. Before you begin, on deck we will have Kaylin Schneider who works with Education Minnesota. Mr. Shaver, when you begin, please start by stating your name for the record. Proceed. Chair Hill, members of the committee, good afternoon. I'm Matt Shaver, Policy Director at Ed Allies. I want to thank Chair Pryor for carrying the Governor's Policy Bill and for opening up an opportunity to provide public comment. Uh, we support the proposed tweaks to the READ Act and know that these will supplement the ongoing work among stakeholders on READ Act 2.0 to ensure that all students have access to structured literacy. Um, on May 17, 2023, the Federal Office of Special, excuse me, Special Education Programs, OSEP, sent a non-compliance notice to Commissioner Jett, identifying that Minnesota's Tier 1 Special Education License was out of compliance with IDEA because it did not limit renewals to three years. The department returned a corrective action plan to OSEP on July 17th, committing to limit the renewals of Tier 1 Special Education licenses to three years in order to be fully in compliance with IDEA. Our organization supports that change, which is included in House File 3782, beginning on line 26.3. We believe we can bring our licensure system into compliance with IDA without exacerbating teacher shortages or creating additional barriers or hoops in our licensure system. However, 
We have serious questions and concerns about making changes to Tier 2 license requirements as proposed beginning on line 27, 27.17. As OSEP never mentioned Tier 2 in any memo to our state regarding our licensure laws, they don't think it's because they forgot to look or didn't understand our tiered licensure system. Additionally, MD's corrective action plan submitted to OSEP does not mention making changes to Tier 2. I personally participated in conversations with OSEP and MDE over the summer and into the fall on the matter and was assured by all parties that this issue was confined to Tier 1. That is the only area in licensure that needed to be addressed. The federal agency charged with holding our state accountable to IDEA said Tier 1 is out of compliance, but not Tier 2. So why are we seeing a proposal to change Tier 2? It's unnecessary and has the potential to become a barrier for teachers in our licensure area with the greatest staffing needs. Finally, going back to 2021's House File 950, Governor Walls has sought to limit the use of prone restraint on children in public schools by all adults, including school resource officers. As we're all aware, that provision finally passed last year, and it's been said that there's a need for clarity in the law. So it is disappointing to not see language from Governor Walls in this bill that both clarifies and maintains the spirit and intent of last year's law to limit the use of prone in schools other than in situations involving imminent bodily harm or death. Prone restraint has not gotten safer for children since 2021, so why abandon such a clearly student-centered position? I want to thank you all for your time today and for your public service to our state. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Up next, we have Caitlin Schneider from Education Minnesota. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. My name is Caitlin Snyder. I am a lobbyist with Education Minnesota. Um, I will start with my comments on Article 3, Section 2 and 5. Mr. Schaefer outlined the concerns in this area. Um, I, we would dispute a couple of the facts of the case. Minnesota has been violating federal special education law for at least the last five years and has been um, well documented um, with OSEP. We appreciate the language brought forward by MDE and Pelsby to address this situation. Um, we find this to be a moral failing for our students that we are in this position right now, but if that's not compelling enough for you, it also endangers, endangers our federal funding for special education. So happy that we are coming into compliance. And part of the reason why we're in this situation today is because OSEP never in, anticipated a world in which a state would require literally no training in special education in order to be a special education teacher. And that's what we're modifying right now. So I appreciate the changes brought forward by MDE and Pelsby. I would say they could even be strengthened a little bit by adding um, language in section two and five to say that the applicant is demonstrating the standards of effective practice because that is how we know that our teachers are meeting um, the literacy standards, the standards on special education, the content and pedagogy standards that we expect. Moving on, um, Article 1, appreciate the changes in the directory info. We think this could be expanded as well for uh, parent teacher associations and some other places. We're seeing some limitations there. Um, Article 4, Read Act on 33.27, there is an inclusion of school readiness teachers. We're in conversation with MDE. We're not entirely um, in agreement that school readiness teachers should be included in the Read Act instruction. These can be very minimal programs with um, one lead teacher, a number of non-licensed teachers, um, just something that we're having a, an ongoing conversation with the department about. We are very happy about the changes in section 14 of Article 4, Article 4 which includes stipends in the literacy incentive aid. This is something that we have maintained is an allowable use of literacy incentive aid um, and sometimes struggle to convince other folks about that. We appreciate the changes in Article 5. I would say that I appreciate the language that's in Representative Feist's bill a little bit more strongly. Um, we are supportive of Article 6, Section 2. Um, and one flag for Article 7, Section 1, this changes the definition of the health professional at the Department of Education. It's my understanding that the licensed school nurses have some questions about these changes, so just flagging that for further discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Schneider. Uh, moving forward, having no more testifiers, we will move now to member discussion members. Uh, as we do have a floor session ahead of us, we ask that you keep your remarks uh, as brief as possible to convey your questions, ideas, and concerns. Thank you in advance on that front. And with that, we'll now open it up uh, for discussion. We'll start with Representative, excuse me, Chair Joachim. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And maybe I could have Ms. Schneider come back down again. I just wanted a quick question.
Thank you, Ms. Snyder. I really do appreciate your comments on the OSEP language, and you had a good suggestion that I wanted to make sure I wrote down about what, you, what language that we should add, because you're right, our Tier 1 and 2 teachers um, have not had special training to work with our kiddos with special needs, and people should know up to 50% of our special ed teachers are Tier 1 and 2 teachers, and that is why it's so important for the OSEP language to be um, the OSEP concerns to be acknowledged and fixed. So you had mentioned wanting some special language added that might help. Could you tell me again so I could write it down? Uh, Mr. Chair. Please, Ms. Snyder, proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, um, in the sections outlining the new requirements for Tier 1 and Tier 2 special education teachers, there is a reference to professional licensure. In addition to that, I think it would be appropriate to include language that says demonstrates the standards of effective practice. Chair Yukim. Thank you. Representative Erdahl, you're up next. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I think I want someone from the department to probably as best to answer the questions that I have. Um, and it's a couple of topics that I have uh, uh, over the years been been talking about. First of all, um, is there anything in here that addresses staff and uh, teacher safety? Uh, violent activities happen in, in our schools uh, upon uh, teachers and staff. Anything about that? What would the response is? Representative Ariola, or excuse me, uh, Director Ariola. I can do this. Oh, please. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Erdahl, I think we outlined some of those provisions in this bill. There was a lot of work done previously. A non exclusionary discipline, our staff is doing a tremendous amount of training and uh, updating on that. So, this bill, I think, you know, you heard what's focused in here um, related to that. It was pretty, the, the bill this year generally is focused on a lot of technical changes and cleanup from 2023. Um, so that's, that's what I would say about that. And I think if you have ideas about uh, what you'd like to see included, we're always open to having those conversations. Mr. Chair? Please, Representative Birdall. Uh, well, thank you. Yes, I have ideas. And I have uh, actually have a, a bill or two dealing with this. And, uh, you know, certainly would appreciate uh, talking about those bills more. And, uh, you know, whether in this committee or, or with the uh, uh, representatives of MDE but you know it is it is a serious problem and I'm not looking in my legislation for a recrimination um, or recrimination uh, with students or anything but uh, we'll, I'll talk about that more later but I think it's something that we need to address um, second thing mr. chair and uh, I notice in here that uh, the uh, civics has been delayed for a year and uh, I'm aware of that decision and uh, you know acquiesce to it uh, but I'm I just want on the record to hear that the purpose of the delay is not to change the the, uh, the legislation Ms. Ariola thank you mr. chair representative Erdahl um, we've appreciated having these conversations with both you and Senator Swadzinski on this uh, on, on this topic uh, we are looking to make the transition to all the new requirements from law last year as easy for our districts as possible. Um, the delay is necessary in order for us to be able to allow districts time to implement the new social study standards that have been passed by the ALJ and that um, and have time for students to be able to start these courses and complete them um, under those requirements that still exist and for the new social study standards before we jump into government and citizenship in its explicit manner per the law but we are committed to continue to working to make this work for our schools. Thank you. Follow up, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate those comments. Uh, you know, we are certainly concerned that uh, the, the statute, which is a law, is conformed with. And uh, you know, we're willing to, to continue to work with you on this. Had a, a meeting last week uh, with the commissioner. And uh, hopefully uh, we're, we're reaching a uh, amicable conclusion to this. 
but uh, again, wanted to uh, be assured that the purpose of the delay is not to change the law. Thank you, Representative. Up next, we have Representative Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I just have a, a thank you for a very thorough walkthrough of the bill. Um, I did have a couple of questions about Article 4 in the Read Act. So, um, and I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. And so um, the first question I have is on word study. And um, this is for me just to make sure that we are not going back to three queuing and word guessing. In 29.29, uh, .29, it does have the word or in there. And I just wanted to know where the definition came from of word study. I'm all for making sure that we're looking at etymology and prefixes and suffixes and all that stuff. Just want to make sure that we're staying true to the science of reading. Whoever, whichever one in MDE wants Ms. to. Ms. Ariola, please. No, you're, you're fine, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Mueller. Um, so word study is part of, I, is from my understanding from our staff, part of the available, uh, the available literacy content that is out there right now. Um, I, uh, from my understanding, it should not move us back to the three, you three, three queuing. You, thank you. Yep, they're fine. Three queuing. No, we're good. The three queuing system in any way it is intended to maintain the integrity of the Read Act. Mr. Chair. Please, Representative Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so I'll just be watching just to make sure that we have a good solid definition on that. The other, the um, I did have the same concern as um, Edmund about the school readiness programs. We have a school readiness program that is kids corner and um, it's sometimes staffed by 16 year olds, you know, with a t so I want to make sure that we are really clarifying that language. And so um, I just really think that's a, a really important thing to clarify. And then my only last uh, comment on the read act is on line 30.27. And this is when you were clarifying which teachers have to be trained and how you were trying to clarify instead of just all other teachers, you're like teachers of grade four through 12 responsible for teaching reading. Um, if anyone, if you're teaching in secondary school, you, you teach reading. <laughs> and even though if you're a content teacher, you're still trying to teach reading for your content. So does that mean every content teacher, which FYI, I'm fine with, <laughs> but, um, or are you talking about the people who are reading specialists who teach students who are struggling and needing remedial help? Because I, I, I don't think this clears it up enough for us, Mr. Chair. Ms. Ariola. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Mueller. Um, the language that we have inserted in Section 5 has been consistent with the guidance we've been providing to, this, um, to the field. Uh, we're not intending for this to have any change in operations for folks other, other than what we've already communicated to them. Um, so from my understanding, it is intended to be more for the latter class of folks that you mentioned, not for all grades four through 12 teachers. Okay. Representative Mueller. Yeah, just thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, again, I, I want to just really make sure that when you're talking about a secondary teacher, you know, one of the things that we're struggling with the most in secondary school is the fact that, you know, we have very difficult texts and we have teachers who are experts in their field, but sometimes are not experts in teaching reading for their field in their subject area. And so that's a completely separate whole set of skills that we should really talk about. But again, when we're talking about people who are responsible for teaching reading, I mean, all of us really are in secondary uh, school. So I, again, I don't know what you're, if, you're, you're, what, if what you're telling me is reading teachers, people like reading specialists for interme intermediate, it might be more clear to have that in there. And then we should talk about what it's like to make sure our teachers in secondary school are prepared to be able to do that. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Mueller. Any other discussion? Lead Bennett, please. Oh, oh I'm, excuse me, one, one before you. Yep, yeah. go ahead. Representative yeah. Bakeberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple clarifying questions. Uh, I wanna look at, um, Article 6, the Nutrition and Libraries, Section 2, the section around prohibiting libraries from book banning uh, based on content or other subjective uh, ideological objections. So 
in your presentation you had governing board may not. Who is the governing board you're referencing there? Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Chair, Representative Baker, the governing you, Ms. board Ms. would be, uh, that probably could depend on the different type of library entities that are named in statute. Um, we did try to be really clear in the drafting about which of those, uh, which the entities would be included, which type of libraries would be included, but I suppose they could all have different governing bodies, whether that be um, a county or uh, something separate or a school board. Representative Baker. Thank you. That answers my question. So the governing board is the school board. Uh, and that's, let's just be honest, that's where the bulk of this conversation is. So the governing board may not ban, remove, otherwise restrict access to a book based on viewpoint content, message, idea, or opinion. And then it goes into discipline or discriminate against a librarian overseeing a book collection. Then your next bullet goes into library collection decisions must be overseen and there's a list of of qualifications correct um, so so what if a school district does not have a a person overseen um, with those qualifications assistant director morse mr chair representative big bird Part of the amendment was to clarify that, I think to broaden it. We had heard part of the feedback we had heard about this was, what if there's an individual who's been doing this work for 40 years but doesn't meet this yeah. criteria? And so the broadened language is um, also reflective of our, our school district friends who might not actually have an employee. So we've clarified to say it's an employee or a contractor that could meet this definition and provide this oversight. Um, but I am looking at the amendment. If it's not in there, we meant to have it in there. Um, but we did try to broaden it to, to expand it to the language was something like a professional librarian or an individual with extensive collection management experience or in training. So um, that was the intent there was, I think, hopefully to get at what the point you're raising. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Representative Baker. Thank you. It's, it's line 2.17 is where you have extension library collection management experience. So I saw it in the, in the amendment. I just didn't see it in the presentation. So I wanted to make sure that those were jiving. Um, I guess the thing, the, the, the biggest concern that I would have with this is, is we have one person making this decision in a school district. One person. You know, or, you know, however many, you know, in, in, in my, my school district or the school districts I serve, we're probably going to have one person. And as I look at subdivision three, uh, under collection management, it says a governing body under subdivision one or any other public body with personnel authority for the library, and this is the important part, may not discriminate against or discipline a librarian or other professional overseeing a collection under subdivision two based solely on collection management decisions. So first off, there's an assumption that I read, and maybe it's just my bias, but I read that there's not lots of conversations happening between the governing body um, and the, the person making those decisions. But nowhere in schools do we give one person sole authority to make decisions like this. For curriculum decisions, we have curriculum advisory committees or we have curriculum committees where we have multiple stakeholders at the table making this decision. Just at a very simple level, one of my mentors said to me, Ben, you never sail out on the ship alone. Well, with this, the way this is written, that we're not, someone's not sailing out on the ship alone. We're, ki we're putting them in the boat and we're kicking them out all by themselves to make these decisions. This, this is, there are significant concerns with this. This will create significant issues in our districts. And, and we wonder why people are leaving our schools. This is one of the reasons why when we do things like this. So I'll stop with that, but, uh, and I would gladly talk to you more offline, but this is more about politics than this is about books. That's very clear. Thank you, Representative. Up next, we have Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, 
Representative Bakeberg, I do want to talk, I'll talk with you more about the, about the topic you just raised. I do think there's more conversation to be had around that. Um, I'd like to call uh, Mr. Schaefer back down. I had a question about some of the comments he made. Mr. Schaefer, you made some comments earlier about the Tier 2 level in regards to students that are receiving special education services. One of the questions I have is that uh, what I know from the, the data tells is that there's a disproportionate number of BIPOC students that are classified for taking, for receiving special education services. And I, I guess the question I have is what is the rationale for having folks that have less training, less specialized training, being in classroom with those students? Because that's, that sounds like what you are advocating. Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Frazier, I appreciate the question. Um, just, just to be clear, we organizationally support uh, high quality PD and mentorship for all teachers. We also recognize that we have a shortage of teachers and alternative routes to the bathroom. Pathways to the classroom are critical to make sure that we're not exacerbating shortages. And you know, I think from our perspective that erecting additional barriers or hoops to jump through will have a deleterious effect on students' education by not having teachers in those, those positions. Um, no problem with making sure that there are professional development requirements, ongoing mentorship. I've testified, in, we've testified in the past for, for all of these things, for, for all teachers. Um, I think the concern is that the, from the federal level, they are not saying that our licensure system is out of compliance at the tier two level. They're saying explicitly that at the tier one level that is an issue. Um, and it's why we support uh, what MDE sent to OSEP this summer saying, we're going to make this tweak so that we are in compliance um, with IDEA. Representative Frazier. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so Mr. Schaefer, it sounds like, if, so you are supportive of more professional development for, for, for teachers. Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Chair, Representative Frazier, um, high quality aligned with science of reading, all of those pieces, yes. But in this instance, you think it would be a barrier to have more high quality training for these particular teachers? Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Chair, um, Representative Frazier, I think there are a lot of questions about what the impact of this proposal could look like. Um, and it's why we're raising the concerns now, because it's a surprise, frankly, to see this in this bill after the advocacy that we did both at the Department of Education level and then meeting personally and, and specifically with OSEP over the summer and the fall. And so we're open to looking at, at what this is, could potentially look like and should potentially look like it. Um, but I think one of the issues is doing it in the name of a compliance with IDEA when that has not been identified in, as an issue from the federal agency in charge of holding us accountable to that. And so if we're going to make changes, we should make sure that we are doing so at the, at the direction of that federal agency. And then anything beyond that, we should be really thoughtful about how that interacts with our current licensure laws, changes that were made last year um, to who can even qualify to be a tier two teacher at this point. Right now you can only qualify to be a tier two teacher, well starting this summer, you can only qualify to be a tier two teacher if you're enrolled in teacher prep, completed a teacher prep program, or have a master's degree. So tier two is a pretty unique licensure area um, and I think we should be really thoughtful about what those requirements on top of what's already required to get that license need to look like. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I, I hope I'm hearing you correct. As long as we don't disagree that students that need the most, that have the most need and need specialized services and need teachers that are trained with those specialized services, you're not saying that you are against that. Mr. Shaver. Mr. Chair, Representative Frazier, no. All right. Not against it. Follow up, Mr. Uh, excuse me, Representative Frazier. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now I'll go to Lead Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just I do have a couple of questions, if that's okay. And I'm probably going to need department people. <laughs> there they come. By the way, I, I love the bright orange and pink. It looks like spring, and that's what we need. So that's this cold, crazy weather that probably is normal for this time. All right. So um, I just I do have a question since we're talking about the tier one and two changes here. Um, first of all. I guess, you know, I understand that, that Tier 1 and 2 are not optimal licensure for uh, special education, but it, these are pathways that we created as a state. 
And um, we don't want to put, as we were just discussing, too many barriers on these pathways and turn them all into basically tier three because the idea is we want more BIPOC teachers, and many of them are at tier one and two and working toward, this is a great pathway, and other teachers who are on their path to getting tier three and four. So I just want to, you know, I guess call for caution on how many changes we make with this tier. And then my question is, did MDE ever push back against the, the federal um, kind of statements that they made about our tiered licensure system? Because as a state, we decided, and it was signed into law under Governor Dayton, that we would have this tiered system. And it seems like we might have been able to push back a bit on it. So did we ever push back, or did we just kind of fall back and say, okay? Assistant Director Ariola. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Bennett, um, I am not at, I'm not able to speak about what could have gone into the Corrective Action Plan memo. Um, I can only say that we believe that this meets what we laid out as we, that we promised the federal government. Um, in terms of the comments made about our tiered licensure system, I think that was a little beyond the scope of the memo, so we kept it limited. Thank you. Thank you. Follow up. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Lee Chair. Bennett. Yes, thank you, and um, and thank you for that. I guess again, I'm I'm going to urge, urge caution on these changes. Uh, tier two teachers, which we're changing and really don't need to, so because of the federal issue, that's a target towards tier one. But tier two teachers already get and are getting a lot of professional training. That's part of that tier, and so to add more onto them again, as we had other testifiers talk about, we, we don't want to overload this so much that we drive teachers out of that because we want more teachers. So I know we all want that. And Mr. Chair, I do have another um, Please. question. I've got to get back to my notes here. Um, and talking about the um, book ban provision, uh, like Representative Bakeberg, I'm concerned about this. Um, and one thing I, I'll, I'll make couple comments and then I do have a question. Just using the term book ban is rather offensive to me because it makes a mockery of what true book bans are. Book bans, when people are, are told, oh, we're banning books, what comes to mind? Nazi Germany when people were arrested for owning or reading certain literature. Or North Korea where you can't even own a Bible or you end up in the concentration camps. So I think we have to be careful what language we use here because uh, to me, I don't see what's wrong or appropriate about protecting children from uh, literature material that is either not age appropriate, and, and again, who decides age appropriate? That's going to be one of my questions. Um, but I think as a society, we, we want to protect children from explicit material. And um, we have you know, television ratings, video game ratings, all these things. And so there shouldn't be a problem. It's not a book ban. We're just saying it's not available in the school library because it's not appropriate for there. So I want to make that comment. But I guess one of my questions is, and I'm happy that you added age appropriate here because I was very concerned, and I still am concerned, but who decides what age appropriate is? That's my first question. Thank you, Assistant Director uh, Ms. Morris. Mr. Chair, Representative Bennett, that would be kind of determined as part of a uh, what somebody who's trained in collection management would be evaluating. I will quickly get out of my depth, not being a professional librarian um, or uh, somebody trained in constitutional law, but there are parameters. Um, one of the examples is that there's a court case uh, that resulted in the Miller test, Miller v. California, that sort of sets out some of the param parameters around obscenity. But those are all things that these trained professionals take into account when they're thinking about what books are reflective of the community that they're serving, and that's going to look different in every single community and is part of the role and responsibility. So a school library is going to look different than a library that you know, is open for adults. Thank you. Lee Bennett. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, that, that is good, and they should be different, <laughs> yes. <laughs> should look different. Um, and I do hope that's, that is the case but it concerns me when we're locking things in. And so another question I have, and if I could pull up my notes, um, the various uh, definitions that a book cannot be judged by, by content, by the opinion, by the viewpoint, all those terms. So I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios, if I could, and just ask if a book could be removed on 
the basis of what we have in uh, definition here. So, and these are um, issues that at least one of them has come up in a school. Let's say um, we have a, a librarian or a qualified uh, person, as it talks here, who picks a book that's an award-winning book. They get it in there. They haven't read it. Find out after it goes into circulation that there is a, a highly explicit and almost pornographic um, talk about there was a book once in a library where it talked about a young girl being raped and her thoughts about it, very explicit, and she's kind of, you know, questioning whether she enjoyed it, and not, not something that should be in a school library. Uh, that's one book I'm wondering, could something like that be removed for its content, because here it says it can't. And secondly, what if there was a book, say, with, called for genocide of uh, the country of Israel, the Jewish people? Could that be re removed, because that's a viewpoint? So I'm just wondering, how do these things work? I Question. Thank you, Lee Bennett. Assistant Director Morris. Mr. Chair, Representative Bennett, the intent of the provision, and so I think um, sort of hear you on, on the label of book banning, but the intent really is about open access to information, um, not having political and bodies make decisions about, again, access to information. So it would be the qualified librarians who have training um, and who are responsible and obligated to look at the community's needs that they're in and what serves them to understand some of those um, tests and case law that I mentioned. So I would be able to speak to a specific example, but would say that that rests in, in the, the hands of the professionals who've been trained to do that evaluation um, collectively. And, and also would point out, this doesn't mean that a book, every single book has to be in a collection. Collection management and the, the sort of um, process that, in, that that entails with engagement, with their with background, with the expertise that those individuals have, that I don't, but that would inform what a collection in a library looks like and um, would then inform decisions like the questions that you're asking. Thank you. Mr. Chair, one more if I could. Leave minute. Thank you, and I, I'm just gonna close here and I, I won't even ask a question, but I'll just say I, you know, I heard you say it, taking the politics out of it and, and allowing for basically local control. But I see this as removing local control and inserting politics because you're saying that books cannot be removed except for certain things. And basically it's gonna be very difficult once a book gets in to have that book removed. And I believe this belongs at the local level with locally elected school boards. They are not political units. They're locally elected to run their school districts that's what they're there for. That's local control. And um, this state control does not belong in this situation. We have parents, and I, I feel like this is almost an attack on those parents who have come forward to various school boards with books they're concerned about, and um, basically they're going to be shut down. Any parent who comes with a concern is like, sorry, the state says you can't challenge things based on content, viewpoint, opinions, and so on. I think it's very dangerous, it's very concerning, and it's best left at the local level. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lee Bennett. Uh, and apologies, I did miss a hand earlier. Uh, very briefly, excuse me, lead, excuse me, <laughs> Chair Ewakeen. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Hill. You did not miss me. I got my hand up late, and I'm sorry. I just wanted to thank uh, Representative Pryor for doing your due diligence, like we all do as chairs, and bringing the um, policy bill of the governors forward in having this discussion. I'm, help, I'm sure we'll be having more discussions and all the items in here as you put your own policy bill together. And I do want to appreciate what Representative Bennett said about being careful about what words matter on book bans. I also want to remind folks, too, that words do matter and to be very careful about making Holocaust references. There's some things that should be just left unsaid. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Uh, we'll close with Chair Pryor, please. Thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Commissioner, for um, introducing the bill, which we will, as, as we say, um, <coughs> will hold over for further consideration. And there will be further consideration. And I do renew my motion to lay over House File 3782 as amended. Wonderful. Thank you, Chair Pryor. And with that, uh, I will lay over House File 3782 as amended for further consideration.
At this point, we have concluded our business for the day, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.